Okay, so uh, I'll be uh, talking about some stuff which I've been dabbling in very recently. And my, I start, I, just to, for a bit of history, my work on dark energy started in collaboration with Paddy. So it's a good thing to talk about it here for me at least. Although this audience does not need this introduction, it's still <coughs> a, a pie chart or a cake chart if you've, it's a birthday conference. So it's nice to put in here and just to remind that, uh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> which sector do you want? Okay, so universe uh, energy budget has evolved from here to here, from early on to today. And uh, observations have told us that uh, there is this uh, completely under, uh, non uh, standard, completely un, un understood and dark component which we are dominated by. And this actually led to a flurry of activity in trying to understand what this is and trying to basically propose a large number of models. It's embarrassingly large number of models which try to say what dark energy is. The only thing we know is roughly this is the, this number is perhaps the only thing we can reasonably say from observations that this is correct. Although uh, I would also mention that even before supernova observations confirmed this, there have been indications of something like a cosmological constant in uh, the universe. And the matter, uh, the energy density, energy did not just add up to what you expect. And those were confirmed with the supernova observations. And I've always liked to put this, at least in the dark energy talk, it's an observational driven field. Okay. So it actually started because observations told us to do it. Uh, for simplicity, and also the fact that CMB observations put uh, the curvature of spatial curvature of universe to be flat, it's very nice. It makes life simple. We, for this, we have parameters, which is the energy density of matter. And if it's flat, omega of dark energy is related to this. And W is the equation of state parameter, which is the ratio of pressure and the energy density which is zero for non relativistic matter and minus, less than minus one third for dark energy. And let's ignore radiation for the time being. Okay. So this is uh, essentially a, some work which a project student did for a bit. This is uh, the, let's say, present day constraints using uh, three different types of data sets. Okay. This is the supernova union, uh, union compilation data. Of course, there is GLA data after that, but nevertheless, the conclusions do not change by much. This data is uh, the direct measurements of Hubble parameter. And this is the different points which the BAO observations give us. Okay. And you can see that this uh, combining all these lead to very tight constraints on the equation of state parameter of dark energy. They lead us to cosmological constant, more or less, okay. simplest model of dark energy. However, there is still a small range around minus one, which is allowed even if you put all the uh, observations together. And it's nice to have these orthogonal observations, which give us a very small range allowed. Now this, uh, interestingly, this data has so far only six points. And because of the long lever arm, you get very tight constraints on the equation of state. Now, in general, this equation of state, all the models, apart from cosmological constant, say that this equation of state is a function of time, redshift, scale factor, depending on what your loyalty is. One can do it, one can write down any number of models and try to fix them with observations. However, one can do a simplified version, again, as we want to make our life simpler is always, you parameterize or perish. So, there are only two crucial parameters. One is the present day value of W, which is W0 for future, for further reference in this talk. And its variation with respect to redshift. Observations are not uh, sen uh, sensitive to go beyond any number of parameters. So two are enough for any function which you want to assume for a dark energy equation of state parameter. So that's the empirical response. Okay, if you, this one, this, no, this is a function which one assumes, let's say. 
I'm coming to that. So let's see. Uh, suppose I put p equal to 1. This is the uh, famous CPL parameterization, which has been worked out with various people for different. This is uh, z by 1 plus z is just Taylor series expansion in the scale factor. Okay. P, if I put p equal to 2, this parameterization I wanted to put because we had proposed it. <laughs> okay. So this p equal to 2, now you see that change in the nature of uh, these two, this simple function is giving us two different natures of the evolution of the equation of state parameter. One is the simple Taylor series expansion, which we work with. Now, that parameterization does not allow very large variation at low redshifts. And the large redshift behavior of CPL parameterization is different if you put from p equal to 1 or you put p equal to 2. If you put p equal to 2, this is this allows large variation at low, low z and the function reverts back to its original value which we started from at large redshifts. This is a toy model which we played around with for a bit just to see if two different behaviors of equation of state parameter, what kind of results will they? So this is uh, the same data for p equal to 1 parameterization and p equal to 2 parameterization. Uh, I think because of lights, it's not very visible. This is supernova data. This line is the cosmological constant because rho does not change. But this is PAO, H of Z data, and these are the combined results. Okay. So you see, even the variation in the equation of state parameter is very strongly constrained and I have not even talked about CMB yet. Okay. These are all low redshift observations which I am talking about. So this is uh, the allowed range in both. And notice that these two parameterization, despite the fact that they have completely different behavior, the uh, rho is the one which is being strongly constrained. This is dark energy density as uh, uh, the scale to its present value. And you see the ranges are, the range allowed is comparable in both the cases. Okay. This is what we had done early on. Notice this was uh, SNLS data when it had come out. This is WMAP, this is combining with WMAP5 data what the range that was allowed then and now. Notice that this is 0.1 and this is 1. So essentially whatever range is allowed here is the total range here. So we are here now, then and now. It looks similar, but the ranges are different. The plots are different. So I just put these plots as they were in the earlier paper. Okay. Now this line is if w is less than, if w equal to one-third, minus one-thirds. Okay. So all this is disallowed at three sigma. These different regions are one, two, and three sigma. Now what would one would like to ask, because there is a large number of scalar field, parameters and variation anyway is reasonably parameterization independent, if not completely parameterization independent. Can we, using those observational constraints, say something about what is the nature of the scalar field potential that we can have? Okay. Let's start with the simple canonical, uh, also known as quintessence scalar field. Okay. This is the energy density, this is the pressure, and you have acceleration if the kinetic energy term is subdominant to the potential energy term. Okay. Since a little bit of W less than minus 1 is uh, also allowed, these are the phantom models, in which there is a negative kinetic energy. Okay. These models have a problem that there is the structures try to rip themselves off in finite time. Now these are also, uh, these uh, phantom models are also earlier work called C fields, which were uh, creating matter to keep the uh, uh, static universe in place, but how well they have this. Way. So I just put them and let's see what happens if we want observations to tell us what form of scalar field potential is allowed. Okay. It's very simple. The idea is extremely simple. In fact, it's back up the envelope calculation. You write down the potential in terms of it's as a function of redshift and this is the variation of the scalar field with respect to the redshift. And this is, of course, rho dE. So what I'm doing here is I'm asking what potential is allowed if equation of state parameter remains constant. Okay. 
So I will not talk about the varying, but I have done this calculation for different types of parameterizations also. So let's keep things simple here, and I keep W equal to constant. This is the way dark energy density will evolve, and you have to solve these equations together, and eliminate Z out of these, and see the form that you get. And lo and behold, you get the exponential potential, which we have already uh, seen in the previous talk. But one might object, why? And this is, they here, I have assumed that universe is filled only with the scalar field. One might object that there is matter in the field. We want that kind of evolution. And again, you absolutely get a closed form of a potential. You get a sine square, sine hyperbolic square behavior, which for a large phi reverts back to this form. Okay. So safely, you can assume dark energy, uh, completely dark energy dominated universe, find out the potential that you want okay, from the parameterization, allowed range of parameterization that you want. And you can tweak the parameters such that it works for this case also. Okay. Now, you can have any parameterization you have, any favorite parameterization, okay? Complete domination of dark energy, the potential is there. So, Z, W is a function of Z or? Uh, no. Constant. But you can just put a parameterization, integrate it, and find the potential. And tweak the constants and fit them with the data. Is that W, the W is uh, Yes, yes. Because you want your observations, the values today, and you want to see what kind of behavior it had early on. Okay. If you change W as a function, okay, uh, for, I have. Uh, we can talk about it in detail later after the talk. I have done it for CPL parameterization. Full. I can find out the analytical form of the potential, and in the correct limit, it does turn out to be the exponential potential. Or, yeah. Okay. Now this is for, uh, okay, again. Now this is two different values of W. If you have quintessence, or the canonical scalar field as we know them, and this is the form of the potential for the phantom field. If W is a constant, this is the exponential potential. Now notice that since the dark, uh, this plus or minus, plus corresponds to the case when we have the canonical scalar field and minus is for phantom potentials, okay? And this minus, plus or minus sign makes this difference in the form of the potential. Mind it, the background evolution in both the cases is same. Okay. And you can extend this discussion to the non-canonical scalar fields also, okay? Now, if you want the same behavior, the same W, in a non-canonical scalar field, you get the potential, which has been worked out in this paper using different considerations, a polynomial potential, and this is the potential which is forced upon you if you want this kind of an evolution. Okay. Okay. Now, why do we want to do this exercise? Okay. We want to do this exercise because one might say that difference in uh, structure formation scenarios may be due to different forms of potentials or different forms of background evolutions. Okay. So what one do, what does is one subtracts out the background evolution, same background evolution in two different models and see how structures form in these cases. Now here I've assumed that dark energy is contributing, is a contributing factor to the structure formation. It's not a homogeneous field. Okay. Even if you assume the initial, uh, this is the question which you had asked in the previous talk, even if you assume no dark energy perturbation early on, now since matter perturbations give metric perturbations and dark energy lives on metric perturbations, it gets those perturbations into place, okay. and the dark energy uh, density contrast starts to grow. Okay. So uh, now look at these two, the dot dash, uh, dot dash line and this dotted line. These two have the same background evolution. This is the exponential potential. I had not used the, uh, in early paper, I had not used the closed form of the potential. I just used the parameterized V of Z in this case. These two have the same background evolution. But you see, if this phi is the gravitational potential, it's a Newtonian gauge. We have assumed no anisotropic stress. This is the gravitational potential evolution. This is the matter-dominated data. As soon as dark energy starts to dominate, the gravitational potential starts to decay. And the way it decays depends on the details of the model now and not just what is the background evolution, 
okay. And this is the corresponding uh, graph for uh, the density contrast in the non related stages of matter. Typically, matter uh, dark energy perturbations try to enhance matter perturbations if you have a scalar field. And again, as Rasit said earlier, fluid is not a good model if you want to study structure formation in the field. So you have to resort to scalar fields. And this line, which is close to this dot dash line, is actually taking the exponential potential and seeing how the dark energy perturbation flows. So this, these two have the same background evolution, but it, as far as structure formation studies goes, it likes to go to its exponential potential type of behavior. So potential is making a large amount of difference when you want to take structure formation scenarios into account. Okay, okay so I will summarize, and I have taken exactly 25 minutes, that dark energy is, background dark energy is equivalently described by fluid as well as scalar fields. Background evolution, no problems. You can go to the favorite uh, data set and see what is the allowed range. There is no explanation of dark energy from any fundamental theory yet, which Ali also mentioned in his talk. Large number of, mod number of models fits equivalently. Okay. You just say this parameter fits, this is the range where it fits, but they are all equivalently either rolled out or allowed. The form of scalar field potential and its range of variation is determined from observations, and one has to go beyond distance measures to further distinguish between these models. And I'll stop here. Questions? So I have just a curiosity. So as you have proved that quintessence model with a uh, dark matter could be uh, explained with a constant state parameter, if I understood correctly, right? So I mean, what is the value of uh, the state parameter should be uh, for current uh, current cosmology, let's say? Okay, uh, you want to see, if you have a constant W model, Yes. Uh, the allowed range is minus 1.2 to minus 0.8 roughly. Okay. okay. So you can take any of these values, and okay. the, the ranges, the, actually the exponential potential I plotted is actually typically the, the typical range that you will get okay. if you, in the potential if you. Okay, and, and it fit, fits with everything, every data yeah. in this range? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. So just want to confirm, if you have only scalar field and your W is constant, you can get a potential which is not exponential. Oh, no, no, okay. You only get a potential which is exponential if you want W. Uh, that's what I was saying. If you go, if your kinetic energy term has higher pot uh, powers, let's say, instead of one, then you get polynomial potentials. Ah, okay, Thanks. I, I, I probably misread your question earlier. Okay. Uh, any further questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, let us also thank all the speakers of the session. So we are coming to end. Thank them for not using MacBook and keeping up on time. So, so any come, uh, so we'll break for the lunch and meet at 2.15 unless we have any announcement from the, so okay.